disclaimer, this story contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and other content that modern viewers might find upsetting. Listen at your own risk. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from The Man Without a Heart by Ruby M. Ayers, and I will be continuing where I left off with Chapter 6. There was a strange silence throughout the little cottage when very early the following morning, Barbara crept down the stairs, her shoes in her hand, and paused nervously at the foot of the staircase. It was barely light. A weird grayness seemed to envelop everything, and outside in the wood she could hear the faint awakening, chirp, chirp, of sleepy birds. A board creaked beneath her foot, and she caught her breath in panic, supposing Asher heard her, and at the last moment prevented her from escaping. She looked back behind her up the narrow staircase, but there was not a sign or sound, and she crept on again, her heartbeats almost choking her. The terror of yesterday had departed, and she could mock at herself for her fear. Why had she been afraid of Asher's threats? Edmund Hyde was quite capable of looking after himself. Her one object was to get to him and to warn him. If Rufus was indeed mad, they would know how to deal with him. If, as sometimes it seemed, he was merely a brute and a bully, well, she stopped, her hand on the latch of the door, as from the sitting room she heard the sound of a voice speaking aloud. There was someone with Asher. She held her breath, listening with strained attention. A queer, confused jumble of words it sounded, and against her will she found herself creeping closer to the door, which stood a little ajar. Someone was with him. Someone. Instinct it was that compelled her to push that do closed door wider, but for a moment she could distinguish nothing in the gloom. Then her vision cleared, and she saw the dead ashes of last night's fire in the grate, the stiff legs of the trestle table, with the remains of last night's supper still upon it, and there, in the chair, she at last distinguished Asher's lumbering figure. He looked all huddled up and shapeless, as if he had fallen uncomfortably asleep, or as if he were ill. Barbara forgot everything but this last possibility. She dropped her shoes with a little thud to the floor, and took a step forward. Mr. Asher? Then, as he made no answer, she went hurriedly to the window and drew back the casement curtains, admitting what pale light there was to be had, before she turned sharply round. Asher had risen to his feet and stood with a hand on the back of the armchair, swaying unsteadily. His face was flushed and his eyes feverish, and Barbara had the queer feeling that although he was looking directly at her, he could not see her. Then he gave a stupid sort of laugh. <laughs> I am sorry. I'm afraid I've got a bad chill. This is rotten climate. I was soaked to the skin last night getting back. Don't look so scared. It's nothing. I've got a touch of my old friend Og, too. I... He put his hand to his head with a little gesture of giddiness. Barbara took a step towards him. Who are you talking, Who are you talking to in here just now? She asked. He shook his head vaguely. Nobody. Nobody's been here. I... His voice trailed away, and he sank back heavily into the chair again, his head falling forward onto his breast. Barbara stood for, for one irresolute moment, then she made up her mind. She could not leave him in this condition. Badly as he had treated her, she could not retaliate so brutally. She put on her shoes, took off her hat and coat, and proceeded to light the fire. Then she fetched some hot milk and made him drink it. He made a little grimace and smiled, but he had soon lost himself again in the vague, incoherent mutterings which had at first attracted her attention. He was shivering from head to foot, although his head and hands were burning hot. His shoulder, where she had shot him the night before, was hurting badly too. She could see, for he winced when she touched it. She fetched rugs and blankets and piled them around him, and presently he dozed off into a fitful sleep, only to waken again to resume the same wandering speech. Barbara stood looking at him with softened eyes. He was no longer a man whom she could find it in her heart to hate. He looked strangely helpless and youthful, as he sat there with his hair all tousled and the fever flush in his face. Not a man of whom to be afraid, perhaps a man to pity or even love. She turned abruptly away at the, that last thought, how absurd, when, we, when he had brutally ill-treated her and made her suffer. She went about the work of the little house as usual. All her plans for flight were forgotten, and from time to time she went back into the sitting room to pile more wood on the fire and to watch Asher in his restless sleep. 
Now and then she could distinguish words in his mutterings. Often he spoke of his sister, and once she got her own name, but chiefly it was of strange things and places that he spoke in a fierce, wild sort of way. And Barbara found herself listening in fascination to this peep of the man, as she had never known him. And once he laughed, a spontaneous, boyish laugh that brought an involuntary smile to her lips. Then suddenly she was aware that the light of consciousness was in his eyes once more, and that he was looking at her in his old sardonic way. She spoke to him gently. I hope you are better. Is there anything I can do for you? Do for me? He repeated her words vaguely, his feverish eyes still upon her. Then suddenly he held out his hand. Come here, Barbara. She caught her breath at the, un at the unwanted gentleness of his voice, and the hot color rose in her cheeks. What do you want? She asked tremulously, but already he had forgotten his request and had closed his eyes again. She watched him all day, anxious and worried, not knowing what to do for the best, and too ignorant of sickness to realize that warmth and rest were all that were necessary to cure him. She sat up with him all night, dozing fitfully now and then, and waking with a start of terror to the remembrance of where she was and what had happened. In the morning she could see that he was not any better, and a morbid terror seized her that he might die. What would she do then? What would become of her? She sat down by the fire and hid her face in her hands. The events of the past days had shaken her to the depths of her foundations. Her nerves felt in rags. She would never have believed it possible that she could suffer so. She had always considered herself so self-possessed. And men who've stayed home all their lives are dancing every night with other fellows' wives. The tuneful doggirl lines haunted her, irretrievably mixed up with the warm night scent of Linda's garden and the smell of the tobacco in Rufus Asher's pipe. She had been wonderfully drawn to him that night. She had liked sitting beside him, listening to his queer theories of life and his philosophy, and he had nearly loved her. She thought of the resolve she had made the first night at, that, at the cottage, that she would punish him by making herself everything to him, and she had failed. He cared no more for her now than he had done the day he brought her here. A log of wood fell smoldering to the hearth, and she looked up to find Asher watching her. She rose guiltily to her feet. Is there anything you want? Is there anything I can do for you? Nothing, thank you. She stopped to replace one of the rugs that had slipped from from about him. Do you feel any better? He answered her question by asking another. Why didn't you clear off and leave me? Tears swam into her eyes. How could I? I thought you were ill. His face took on again its old grim lines. In, in fact, you heap, sorry. In fact, you heap coals of fire on my head, is that it? No, but I happen to be human. And I do not, you mean. I did not say so. She took a glass of warm milk from the grate. If you drink this, you may sleep again. I don't want to sleep again. I am much better. He looked better, though his voice was still weak. She saw with thankfulness that the look of glassy feverishness had vanished from his eyes, and his skin felt cooler. Are you often ill like this? she asked. I had one attack just before I knew you. It's nothing to anyone who understands. But this time, getting wet made things worse, and my shoulder helped, I suppose. She flushed. Your shoulder ought to be dressed again. You shall do it presently. His eyes searched her face. How long have you been sitting there, Miss Ware? All night. It's half past ten now. Half past ten in the morning. And have you slept? I think I dozed sometimes. You hit coals of fire on my head, he said again sullenly. Barbara did not answer. She felt dead tired, but she would not admit it. You have lost an excellent opportunity to run away from me, he said after a moment. Defiance crept into her eyes. The opportunity will come again. Perhaps, when I am strong enough to run after you and bring you back. She took away the empty glass and left him. When later she came back, he was sleeping quietly and breathing more easily. So he was not going to die. She, gr she drew a breath of relief. It was getting dusk when Asher awoke. He gave a terrific long. A terrific yawn, stretching his arms and letting the rugs fall around him as he sat up and blinked across the firelit space at Barbara. How long have I been asleep? he demanded brusquely. All day. He sat for a moment looking at her, then he rose to his feet, moving his injured arm gingerly. Barbara saw the stiff movement and said at once, I will bathe your shoulder again and put fresh bandages on it. 
on, if you will let me. She fetched water and strips of linen, and he sat passively while she carried out her task. Then she rose to her feet with a breathless sigh. There, I think it's better. Does it hurt very much? Not at all, except when I move my arm. She made a movement to turn away, but he caught her hand. How badly do you hate me, Miss Ware? She shook her head. I, I don't hate you. I think I'm just sorry. For me? Yes. He released her. I won't have you sorry for me. You can be sorry for yourself instead. She looked at him with steady eyes. You've no need to be sorry for me, he said again in his old harsh way. Anything I do or have done has been deliberate. I am prepared to abide by the consequences. She gave a wavering smile. I would not like to have it on my conscience that I had ruined a fellow creature's life, she said. What do you mean? I mean that it... I mean that if it ever gets known, as it will do, that I spent all this time here alone with you, the scandal of it will follow me all my life. Not that I care, she added scornfully. He sat staring before him with fierce eyes. Then he said with a sneer, Are you suggesting that I make honorable reparations by asking you to marry me? Is that why you have stayed so willingly? Barbara turned white. I suppose you are deliberately trying to insult me she said, but some day perhaps it will lie in my power to pay you back. He laughed. You need not ride the high horse with me, Miss Warrer, and nothing I have ever said to you can be more insulting than things you have allowed to be said by my, est by my estimable brother-in-law. As I believe I once before reminded you, I at least am unmarried. Barbara swung round. For a moment she was mad with rage, mad with the insults which he, which he had heaped upon her. You brute! Oh, you brute! She sobbed, and beside herself with rage, she lifted her hand and struck him across the face. That brought her to her senses. She fell back, white and shaken, trembling from head to foot, staring at him with horrified eyes, and in the following silence there came a sharp tap-tapping at the outer door. Asher rose to his feet and stood uncertainly clinging to the, arm of his, to the arms of his chair. Then, with a great effort, he mastered his weakness and made a quick gesture, motioning Barbara aside when she would have, when she would have moved forward. Stay there, I'll go. He went out into the little passage, and Barbara heard him fumbling with the bolts and fastenings of the outer door, and she crept after him. The heavy door creaked, o creaked open. There was a silence. Then Barbara heard a, f heard a stifled imprecation and a man's amazed voice. Rufus! Good Lord, man! They then you are here? It was Edmund Hyde. And that is the end of chapter six of The Man Without a Heart by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me. And I hope that you stay, like, stay tuned and or like watch the next video so you can find out what happens next. Have a great day.